uh, just after five o'clock. Um, we are coming together tonight. It sounds like people will continue to join us, um, but we are coming together tonight to uh, join in a virtual farm tour of Connecticut NOFA, NOFA's Ecotype project. Um, this project started about a year ago, uh, maybe a little over a year ago, um, when I attended a, a meeting of the Native Plant Working Group through the Connecticut Department of or Connecticut Ag Experiment Station, um, and was set on a path pathway to bring together a lot of stakeholders to some of whom you will meet tonight around habitat restoration in our state in particular in particular uh, pollinator health. Uh, one of the things that's been important to me is that the ecotype project or I should say often when we talk about farmland in Connecticut we talk about farms as working land um, and Connecticut NOFA has really shifted our definition of that in the last year, particularly um, as a result of this project, um, to a greater understanding that all land in our state must be working land if we are trying to gird ourselves for the changing climate um, and the changing times in front of us. And so working land to Connecticut NOFA is no longer just about farmland. Um, it is about putting your backyards to work, putting our land trusts uh, to work, putting all of our myriad stakeholders to work, soccer fields, et cetera, um, to work for uh, the resilience of our uh, state's climate in the future. Um, so the Ecotype Project um, is headed up by uh, Sephra Alexandra, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, but before we go into that, I also wanted to say, just as a farmer, uh, right before this meeting, I took a quick walk through some of the plots that you are going to be seeing. Um, and I can say personally what a sense of uh, security that this project has lent me as a farmer, to know that a lot of the ecosystem services that we will be describing tonight are happening and cared for um, as part of my farm system. Um, the pollinators are really out there securing my livelihood uh, day by day. And so being able to support them um, has been critical. Um, I'm going to turn this over. The evening will uh, unfold with Sephra uh, introducing the Ecotype project. And then we'll watch a series of videos after uh, each virtual, each part of the virtual farm tour we will have time for questions and answers. Um, please, as we at any time in this, um, if you open the chat box, which is just in the center of your, uh, the bottom center of your screen, you'll see a little button that says chat. Um, and whenever you have a question that you wanna ask or whenever um, you have a, something to add to the presentation, um, feel free to list it in that chat. Um, I will be the one running the Q&A, so I will try to aggregate all of those different questions and ideas and put them to our speakers after their video presentations. Um, so without further ado, I will turn this over to Sephra and uh, look forward to seeing you all at the end of the presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Dina. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited that there are so many people excited about native plants and ecotypes. And um, it's a real pleasure to have you all here. As Dina says, this really takes a lot of strategic partners. This project is really just getting its legs. And there are so many people on this call who are really experts at all the different facets of the work that they do. Um, as I'll show you and as you'll learn through these farm tours is what the ecotype project is doing is bringing all of these seed liberties, as I like to call it, um, together for conservation and restoration work. So I'm gonna share my screen quickly. And so you, we have um, the Ecotype Project, which is the Pollinator Health Initiative of CTNOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Uh, we're working under USDA specialty crop block grant that is basically growing out native pollinator plants for their seed crops. And um, before we get more into that, which is what this virtual farm tour will really help explain, I would like to help give reference and some context as to what an ecotype is. 
So this fantastic map, um, you can zoom out. This is from the EPA and you can see the whole country in terms of its eco region. Uh, and this is more zoomed in, of course, on the East Coast in our area. If you think about, uh, for a second tonight, we're gonna take off our anthropocentric lens, our, our human eyes, and we're gonna put on our bug eyes, as we've been saying. And if you think of Billy the bee and Dougie the dragonfly flying over our, um, our riparian corridors and our habitats, they don't, they don't see Connecticut and they don't see the line that goes into Massachusetts. What they see is these mosaics of different habitats where the riparian areas are, the coastal zones, the broadleaf temperate forests. And so when we're talking about conservation and restor restoration, this is a much more helpful framework to utilize because what this map is showing, and we are here in Eco Region 59, is that any genetics that are collected and selected along these corridors are well suited for anywhere else within 59. Now the nuance can be very subtle between these ecoregions, but really um, what we're trying to do is, is promote this concept. So an ecotype is just referencing the fact that um, the genetics of those native plants were selected from the specific area where they grow in the wild. Um, and the reason why this is important, when you think of the French term terroir, it talks about soil, climate, local pests. When we talk about eco-regional adaptation or bioregional adaptation, um, it's basically what's best suited to thrive and be self-regenerating in our ecosystems. So that's why it's really important to help maintain this wild vigor and diversity through the project uh, that we're doing that Jordi and Jean will help explain. Let's see. So what we've done to help explain this project is create a uh, infographic that kind of goes through the process of how we get sustainably wild collected, sorry, that, that was it. So um, how we get sustainably wild collected seed from out in these wild areas, which is what Jordi is gonna help talk about and bring them onto organic farms to grow out as a seed crop, which is what Jean's gonna talk about with the founder plots at the hickories. And then we come back in and we save that seed and then we pass it along to nursery growers. Uh, Daryl Newman from Planter's Choice might be on this call. And then after he grows out those plugs, we're able to make them available to you, which allows the right plants to be in the right place, which gives our green corridors, our pollinator pathways, our pollinators, really the plants that they're looking for. Just like we like to steward our heirlooms for taste and what does well, our entomological friends are doing the same thing. So um, in an effort to promote conservation and restoration in our area, we're really help weaving together this, this pipeline of experts to be able to make ecotype native pollinator plants available to you all. So without further ado, um, we will be going to meet Jesse Hubbard and Jordi Elkins, who have been our lead seed collectors for this project over at Highstead. And we are going to get to watch a brief video that will explain the process further. Thanks so much for joining. Welcome everyone, I'm Sephra Alexandra, lead of CT NOFA's Pollinator Health Initiative, the Ecotype Project. Today, we are taking you on a virtual tour of our seed collector partners at Highstead. Let's go. Okay, so the important thing about the Ecotype Project is it takes a lot of strategic partners. And for those of you that have now bought plants or have gotten involved with us, you know that first thing we need to do is actually source our seeds. So to do that, we wanna make sure that we're sustainably wild collecting our ecotype seed. And that is what we use to locally grow our founder plots that then grow plants that then you all can have. So ultimately what we're trying to do is have the right plants in the right place and the beginning of that process starts with who I'm going to introduce you to today. Jordy Elkins and his co-seed collector Jesse Hubbard are going to talk you through the process of what it takes to identify a wild stand, monitor it, collect and clean the seed, stratify it, and propagate it, at which point it then goes to the next phase where we establish founder plots. So let's all go to beautiful Highstead and see what it means to be a seed collector. 
Now, one thing that really amazes me about these meadows is just the diversity that's in them. You know, here at Highstead, we've got this incredible landscape with so many different types of plants. We have this common milkweed, which is common, obviously, but we've got uh, at least two other species growing on the property, including purple milkweed, a plant of special concern in New England. Um, but because we've preserved this land, it's really become sort of a, a place for species that, that really are of, of special concern. It's just really important to us to have a place here where nature can really thrive. But part of our mission is also to encourage others to adopt that same ethic. And so by providing plants to the nursery industry and to farmers who can then distribute them to homeowners who can turn their turf grass into a pollinator meadow, you know, that's something that's just really exciting to see, you know, sort of this landscape desert of suburbia really reclaimed um, with natural plantings that benefit pollinators and just the environment in general is really what our work is all about as far as land stewardship side of what we do here at Highstead. Um, Highstead was started in 1982 by the Dudley family. They purchased the land and just absolutely loved it and wanted to do something where they could learn from it and where they could share it with other people. And so they started Highstead Arboretum as a native plant arboretum. Highstead started as an arboretum, but over time we've grown to be a land conservation organization. But our roots have always been here on this property, and we have a long history of working with plants. And that's what really led us to get involved with the Ecotype Seed Project. We felt that uh, we wanted to do some restoration planting on this property, and we wanted to have seeds that came from the local area. and because of our connections with conservation organizations, we had availability of places to collect seed from that we wouldn't otherwise have opportunity or access to those properties. And so because of our, our plant science background and our connection to uh, large nonprofit landowners of natural lands, it really put us in a good position to really lead the, the seed collecting uh, part of, of this ecotype project that we're involved with. Before we head out into the field, we do a lot of planning about what species we want to look for. We started with species that we knew were readily available in the nursery trade because one aspect of this project that is important to us is to get plants that are available to homeowners and to get ones that they're familiar with but that also benefit pollinators. We didn't want to find obscure plants that nobody was familiar with because we figured nobody would plant them. And so we began looking through nursery catalogs and cross-referencing what was available with plants that we also knew were well suited for pollinators. So once we decide what we're looking for, we, we go out into the meadows and we start scouting around places where we think we might find it. What is the right type of soil? what's the right type of ecology, what type of ecosystem does it grow in. And we do a lot of um, scouting in advance to look for it. And then the next thing we have to do is go out and identify the plant and make sure it's actually what we're looking for because once it's in seed, it's really difficult to tell. So for instance, you know, this penstemon will go out and hunt the fields and look for it, confirm the identification, and then mark where it's growing because it's easy to see now that it's in flower, but once these flowers are off and you're in a large meadow full of hundreds of other different species of plants, it's, it's hard to get back to. And so there's a lot of prep work that makes the seed collecting more efficient when we head back into the field. Before we actually do any seed collecting, we always get permission from the landowner. And so, that's what happens, you know, once we identify a population that's suitable for collecting from, then we go and get written permission. One thing about finding the species and collecting the seeds is you, you need more than one plant. You can't just find a single plant growing in the wild and collect seed there. To really have 
a diverse gene pool in the collections, we need to find populations that have at least 50 individual plants. And while that doesn't sound like a whole lot, in some species it can be quite difficult to find that many plants growing together in one area. And then when we go out and collect, we want to have a really wide representation of all the genes that are in that population. So we don't just collect all the seeds from one or two plants, but we want to go and collect across the whole spectrum of all the plants in that population. All the while wanting to be very cautious that we're not threatening that wild population that's there by over collecting. So we just take a very small percentage of, of the seeds, usually you know, under 5%, we never take over 20% of any individual plant or any population in total. So we're really careful about the protocols that we use and wanting to maintain the viability of the populations that we're collecting from, making sure we're not damaging them. This is Jesse Hubbard, one of my co-workers, and, and he's uh, a huge help in collecting the seed. It, it's really a big effort to go out in the field and a lot more than one person can do. And so Jesse helps with a lot of that work. Working with Jordy has been a, a great experience because I've, I've learned a lot about, you know, all the, the native plants in our area, how to collect seeds responsibly, first identifying the, the right plants collecting in a way that we're not harming the populations. It's an exciting thing for me to be out here and doing the collecting to still be involved in the, in the process through the stratification, the sowing, and seeing the end result of the, the plants that are, that are growing from the seed we collect. So here are uh, sieves that we use in, you know, in cleaning our seed, and they're all different sizes. You know, so we're trying to catch, we're trying to separate the seed from the chaff or the shells. This is a number 14, and you know, the, the smaller the number, the bigger the holes. When seed cleaning, it's really just trying to come up with a, a protocol, I guess, for each different plant because they all kind of have their own characteristics as far as how they separate from their shells and, and chaff and everything. So. It's really just trying to find the best method for each species. We put it in the refrigerator in a, in, you know, throw a moist paper towel in there to kind of keep it, you know, it's called a moist stratification. So, you know, many of the seeds require about 30 days, but it varies depending on the species. So in, in stratifying the seeds, you know, under, under moist conditions, it helps to break down the the outer like hard shell and you know kind of mimics what goes on in nature when they're sitting in the, in the moist ground over the winter it speeds up the germination process these are pycnanthemum tenuifolium very narrow leaf mountain mint and the seeds are tiny as you can see and uh it's it's tricky not to mix them with other seeds when you're working with them but the these are uh, one of the, the smaller ones. And this is gonna be the species that Jordy will be talking about. Here's a tray of finished seed after it's been stratified and then sown and, and grown in our greenhouse. This is the final product. And so this is a 72 cell um, and these are ready to plant outside. You can see how well rooted these are. And usually if you plant them by um, spring is ideal, but if you can get them in the ground by midsummer, they're usually fine to make it through and to be established before winter sets in. You know, the need to produce seed is beyond what we can do. It's really a collaborative project. And so we can't possibly grow all the, the plugs that are needed to really support the demand. Um, but being a science organization, we like to understand how each of these plants grows and what the requirements are. And so we grow it here ourselves and we really record, you know, what are the characteristics? What does it take to actually get it to grow? And then we can document that and share it with people that we distribute seed to. So giving the seed and giving the in information to others who can then do some of the work really allows this project to scale up far beyond what we could do if, if we were the only ones working our, ourselves.
Thank you everyone for joining our virtual farm tour of Highstead. Hopefully now you all understand a bit more about the process of what it takes to do wild seed collection and make those plants propagated and ready for our founder plots so we can all get more of these ecotypes to you. Stay involved with us at the Ecotype Project and we hope to seed you soon. <laughs>
um, who are in the Northeast. Um, but if you want to talk a little bit about other folks who are in this space, um, and I know someone asked um, in the chat if the Ecotype Project is in Maine, and I believe they're probably thinking about the Wild Seed Project, but maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, um, you know, USDA has a sort of national level seed collecting um, progr program, and they, it's sort of broken up into regions. And so in the Northeast, there are a number of organizations um, that are working on it. Native Plant Trust is one, um, the Native, um, the, the Greenbelt Project in New York City um, is another, and, and there, there are some in this region. Most of that work is really aimed at landscape scale restoration projects, you know, habitat restoration. Um, and that's what we sort of felt was unique about this is that um, those programs, you mostly have to be a large landowner doing a, you know, a, a restoration project to get access to the seed. But for a homeowner who's trying to do a pollinator garden in their front yard, um, they can't get access to that. And so we sort of felt that this project was bridging that gap and, um, you know, by working with nurseries and farms, um, really opening up access to, to homeowners who, who otherwise wouldn't really be able to get some of these plants. Um, another question that came up is, uh, besides the eco region um, or eco regional plants, are you keeping track of soil type, moisture, slope orientation, sunny, shady conditions um, of the places that you are collecting the seed. It seems like that would be useful to know in terms of how well the plugs will do when it's planted. Yes, um, we do track that information. We actually have pretty comprehensive um, data collection sheets that we use. Um, they're about two pages long and they're probably 50 different things that we fill in. Um, all right, so um, we are closing in on 5.30. I wanna make sure that we have um, time to, to move into Jean's slide. So I'm gonna just take a couple of more questions. Um, but first, are, are, to what extent are we looking for more founder plots? I know NOFA has been busy this year um, and Sephra has been busy trying to find more sites to get these plots going. Um, to what extent is Highstead, are your collections being met by the number of founder plots that are out there? Um, or are you looking to really amplify those numbers? Is it to broaden the species or get more founder plots per species? Um, it, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, it truly is a collaborative project between NOFA, Highstead, um, nurseries, and farmers. And so we're working on um, really trying to broaden the number of species and you know, CT NOFA, SEFRA has been great in really going out and trying to recruit growers to expand that aspect of it so that there um, are more native seeds available. I mean, I, ideally, you know, we're really starting with sort of the, the farmer and the homeowner scale. Ideally, at some point, we can scale this up so that it could also be for larger plantings, you know, along you know, the sides of highways and utility rights of ways and um, solar power uh, farms and, and all that sort of thing. So that, you know, it, we're not growing enough seed right now to do a huge project like that. And eventually we'd like to work with, you know, Xerces or some other larger groups that can really help scale it up beyond um, just homeowners and farmers. So eventually we will need lots of founder plot growers if that's to ever happen. Perfect, thank you. Um, seeing no more questions, I guess we will turn now to uh, Jean Linville and Abby Karsten. Um, I believe we have a video we can play from them um, and then we will come back together after their farm tour. Um, but thank you so much for Jordy and we will, I'm sure, check in with you at the end as well when, as the questions keep rolling in. Hi, I'm Dina Brewster. I am executive director at Connecticut NOFA and I'm also a farmer here at the Hickories. Welcome to our farm. I got involved uh, with the native plants and the ecotype project a couple of years ago when we became concerned about pollination issues on our farm. Uh, and behind 
result of a couple of years of work. It is a uh, series of seven, uh, soon to be 12 founder plots um, that are growing native plants. As organic farmers, we talk a lot about the resilience of a food system into the future. And we as a organization have been working hard on all of the organic activity below the soil, but the Ecotype Project is taking a much broader view of resilience in our food system. So we are here working on issues of biodiversity um, and all of the pollination services that support me as a farmer in growing food for my community. So welcome to the native uh, plant field at the Hickories. You can see we've got several rows of plants. Here we take a slightly different approach than a homeowner would because we're growing these natives for seed production. So we handle them as a crop and that's why they're being grown in a monoculture of one species per one row. We can take you around and show you some of the um, natives that we have here. In addition, as we're walking, you might see a few pollinators. Yeah, we've got quite a few great perfectly happy pollinators as well as some beneficial insects that we're seeing already on the plants which really gives us a good feeling that they are in great shape. So currently blooming right now are the penstemon and uh, these actually, this is their first year of flowering. Many of these rows were actually started uh, last year and so during their first year they really focused on root development and plant establishment. So this is the first year of flowering for the Pestimmon, so we're very excited because we'll actually be collecting seeds from these for the first time. This year we've also introduced several other new species. So initially the first round we did a group of plants last year. This year we're adding to our diversity by putting in rows of other plants. It's a great opportunity to see how all of the plants are now coming to more of a maturity this year and we're going to get a really good feeling about what's happening in the fields and what we're going to be seeing in the future. Our other big seed producer last year was Joe Pye weed. Um, so these two plants, the ironweed and the Joe Pye, they actually performed ahead of schedule because usually the first year that the natives are put in you don't anticipate a large seed production but these both surprised us and we had a great deal of seed from them. This year what we're doing is we're doing a little of experimenting on the edge. You'll see that these plants are shorter. They've been pruned to see if we can control the height. Because again, we're doing these for seed production, we're trying to limit the growth. Ironweed and Joe Pye can, re can attain up to five to seven feet height. So obviously that's not super convenient for seed collection. So we're working on trying to maintain more of a squatty profile to these plants. Um, if you are doing these in your home garden and you are not going to work on pruning them, that's something to consider as far as placement because these two, although they're great performers, stunning bloom color, they're going to be very tall. This is the ironweed. We collected enormous amounts of seed from this last year and it did so well here in the field. We also saw uh, that the stalks that were left over from last year had beneficial insects that had burrowed into the stalks that will be helping the plants this year. So one thing with natives is I think a lot of times we kind of think well I can just like scratch a little hole in my lawn and tuck one in and because it's a native it's going to be super strong and it's going to be able to take care of everything. And the reality is, is they're really not any different than any other plant. And so you really have to do site preparation and you have to do weeding. These are cardinal flower. These are one of our new plants this year. And so until they really get established, there's a lot of attention that they require. The cardinal flower loves wet and we're starting off this year, of course, on, a, on the dry side, so we're a little bit worried about the plants. But the great thing about natives is their resiliency and they will rally and I'm sure that, that they're going to do well as time goes on. So we do a little bit of trialing and experimentation here. 
with all the different plants. So as I mentioned, we've been doing some pruning with the Joe Pie and the Ironweed to check on whether we can limit the stature but still get really good seed production. The other thing that we've been trialing this year is with the Swamp Milkweed. Last year, we had some growth, some seed production, but very low. And they were very um, weak plants. Uh, the aphids moved in and they really did a number on them. They didn't have the strength to kind of bounce back from the aphid infestation that happened. So this year what we're doing is we're, we're not weeding that aggressively. We're letting a lot of the grasses go in between the swamp milkweed to see if it helps support them and also if it just helps give a little bit more of a diverse ecosystem within that row so that the plants will be healthier. We're kind of in the very beginning of what this is going to turn out, but so far this year, I think that both of us are pretty happy with the way the swamp milkweed is looking. So we're growing two types of mints. Um, these were also put in last year. This year, they're taking off gangbusters. Last year, they just really did not have much growth uh, and very little seed production. This year already, they're twice the height that they were last year, and you can see how thick and full these are. One thing I didn't really mention, but we do a compact spacing on all of these plants. Um, whenever you buy seed or purchase a plant, it usually has a recommended spacing. And generally what I do is I cut it back by a third. So it's a more compact spacing. And because we're growing them in rows, what that does is it, it fills it in and it's kind of a natural weed control. And that happens with all of the established plants. The younger plants, like we looked at with the cardinal flower, because they haven't really grown yet, they're not doing that weed suppression on their own yet. But most of the more mature stands require little to no weeding. This is the row where the black-eyed Susan is going. We are working on the row. We've turned the soil over. We've added compost, and we're doing it like a, a slightly raised bed and the other part has already been planted and we're going to be working on this today to get the rest planted. So this is the uh, bed that's been prepared and the black-eyed Susans have been placed inside of it. You can see the staggered spacing. This is a little bit what I was talking about, how we do slightly more compact spacing to accommodate bigger plants like a black-eyed Susan, the ironweed, the Joe Pie. What we do is we do a staggered spacing. So this row is offset from this row. This allows us to give each plant the spacing it requires but doing more of a compact spacing to help suppress those weeds. Here we have the wood aster, which does need a shady environment with a little dappled sun because normally they grow on the sides of the roads or in the edges of fields or, or woodland areas. And so getting the habitat right for this was important. So as you can see, we've entered a part that's very different of the, of the farm. There's a row of trees that are providing shade for a good part of the morning. It's not until afternoon before the sun comes in here. So they're, they're missing out on that strong, strong, harmful sun, which is perfect for these plants. If we had put the Joe Pie over here, it wouldn't be as happy as it is in the main field. You want to really pay attention to the requirements of the plant as far as, you know, light, the type of soil, the level of moisture, all those things are factors when you're determining your location for where to put in your natives. Hi, this is Dina again. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us at the Hickories at our farm here in Ridgefield. Uh, and a special thanks to Jean and Abby for all they have done to see these seeds into production um, in service of our food system and the pollinators. This effort has been really transformative for our farm and I'm thrilled that so many people like you have gotten involved to support the project as it's grown over the years. Thanks again.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Jean, um, and to Abby as well, um, and Monique for all of this filming. There's been a, a host of people who have made this possible, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so uh, one of the things that it occurred to me as I was watching this uh, video, and then I will uh, quickly turn this over to Jean and Abby, but um, I was remembering that my mom, when I was about five years old, had to stitch together for me my first bee suit because I, uh, they didn't make them in kids' sizes back then. Um, and so I've been beekeeping my whole life. And as a farmer, um, I've always been so aware of how important that practice is. Um, and I've raised honeybees for 40 years. Um, what is extraordinary to me about the founder plots at the hickories is to the extent to which all of the trouble that has come to the honeybee <laughs> um, is sort of replaced by the ease and joy um, of starting these founder plots that doing what I know how to do, which is grow plants, um, has sort of created this, it, it is my new backyard beehive. Um, and it is in fact my backyard bird feeder as well. <laughs> um, they have, they do double, triple, quadruple duty. Um, and it was just nice, a, a nice re a reflection for me. Um, Jean and Abby are with us. I don't know if you guys, um, before I get into questions, are there any sort of comments you want to make having seen the video or should we start out right into questions? Um, I would just uh, offer a little bit of an extension of, of what we're seeing. We've mentioned the protocol sheets and they're kind of living documents that we've been modifying. We started them last year with the initial round of plants that we put in and we've extended it now to the additional ones for this year. But we're also making notes on, on protocols that are evolving. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the swap milkweed and what we're doing as far as letting um, other plants grow within them. We're already seeing a huge improvement in that particular plot because of that. So that's something that will go into the uh, protocol sheet. So they are being updated uh, pretty much live. And one of the other things that was kind of an accidental discovery uh, this year was the fact that we had to hold the, the rutabecchia longer than we had anticipated um, to get the, it took, before we got the row prepped. And so what happened was we took them from the deep 72s that they came from high set in and we transferred them into 18s and so they had a chance to really do a lot more root, root development in those 18s before we put them into the field and it's been really interesting to see um, how much faster that particular row has settled in and I think it's it's a lesson going forward that I think it'll be included in the protocol sheets is the idea of to do some up potting and to hold them again because uh, the plugs are usually really nice root development before they go in but still because it's a relatively small plant it takes a while for them to get established um, and kind of take over the area and do that weed suppression so I'm, I'm inter interested to follow this row out for the season and see the difference that it made, but so far I'm seeing a difference. So I just want to point that out that um, we, will, we are working on the protocol sheets. We hope to make them available to the public soon, but they are going to be a living document and there will probably be updates to them periodically. Great. Um, starting sort of back with some of the, the basic questions, um, is there a minimum size to the founder plot? And Jordy, you may want to jump in on this as well. Is there a minimum size to the founder plot, both in acreage and in number of plants, um, and why? Um, so our, you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we do have a minimum. Jordy, you can deal with that. The space it's going to require is going to depend on the spacing of the individual plant, and that's where the protocol comes in. Um, so you do need to do some number crunching as far as which species you are going to take on and do the math to figure out what row space you're going to need. Um, because it does vary to some that need as little as 40 to 50 feet to others who need 80 feet, um, depending on the spacing. And, and as far as um, just the, the quantity, the quantity, um, we use a, a protocol that was developed by Seeds of Success and the recommendations that we were given was that to produce seed lots that have a broad enough genetic diversity, they really need to come from founder plots that have at least 200 uh, individual plants. 
and, um, and so that's what um, and be able to, to to grow. Terrific. Um, how do you know pre-germination treatments for the different plant species? So before they get to the founder plot, how are you figuring that out? You, you want to answer that one, Jesse? Sure. Yeah, we've uh, gotten a lot of that information just through simple Google searches and just making sure um, that, you know, whatever sources we're using are pretty reliable. Um, and then we generally try it out in the greenhouse at least, you know, once and see, you know, what we're getting and how that corresponds with, with the information that's out there. Kind of test it. Um, you guys have mentioned these founder, uh, sorry, the protocol sheets a bunch. I know, um, Monique, in the background, I think you have some of those to share with us so we could take a quick look at them. Do you want to see if we can pull up that screen in a minute? What will happen with these um, is that over the next three to six months, um, Connecticut NOFA will be making these available to any farmers who want to install founder plots or even install uh, native plant habitats on their farm. Um, you can take a look at them here. They are plant specific. Um, they talk a little bit about the pre-germination, the germination, and then the maintenance and establishment years. One of the things that I know I have found is that growing these plants in a founder plot for me as a farmer, and, and Jean spoke a little bit about this in the video too, is uh, effective, it's more effective than any of the pollinator meadows or hedgerows or anything that I've tried to, conservation efforts we've tried to do, because growing these plants, they are, we are growing them as a crop. And so it is, um, it's what I know how to do, <laughs> which is, you know, grow in four foot wide beds and cultivate in between. Um, and yet it serves the same um, ecosystem services. Um, one of the questions that came up um, about the placement of these founder plots um, thank you for sharing that, Monique. Um, but back to Eugene, one of the questions that came up as a, and maybe to Jordy as well, um, is there a concern about cross-pollination and to what extent um, are we dealing with that? Um, I, the biggest concern would be cross-pollination with cultivated plants of the same species. And, um, that's part of the reason that, you know, that, that's the whole reason we're doing this is, is to really have local genes in the plants that we're distributing. And so um, if, if they're cross pollinating with wild plants of the same species, because they were collected and grown in the same ecotype, we're not overly concerned about that. But if there were, um, you know, cultivars of a same species, uh, that that would be a concern. Um, and so, you know, we just recommend to farmers, you know, be aware of that if there are any nearby. Um, I don't have specific information on what the exact distance is, you know, for uh, plants to stop that cross pollination, but just ask people to be aware of it. And that was the point I was going to bring up is that some of it deals with what the pollinators are. So part of it is knowing who the pollinators are for that particular plant and then looking at the distance that they normally travel on a given day of going out and collecting um, and making sure that you don't have those cultivars within that range. One question that I know I hear a lot as I talk about this project and as we um, because it is in its infancy, we're often sort of navigating this, making the road by walking, so to speak. Um, but a question that often comes up is uh, for both of you guys uh, to answer more from the homeowner side of things. For folks who are listening to this and learning about ecotypes, many of them will say, well, are native ours bad? Does that mean I have to go home and rip out all my native plants because I don't actually have <laughs> um, ecotypes growing in my yard? How would you answer that for, for the homeowner? I, I would answer it by saying, um, you know, progress, not perfection. You know, five years ago, I was not a huge um, believer in the fact that we really needed to use native ecotypes. Um, 
but if you think about, um, you know, particularly with plants that are, are threatened or species of special concern, if, if there's a, a small gene pool of a, a certain plant and we're bringing in lots of genes from outside um, this ecoregion, um, there is a possibility of cultivated plants and native plants cross-pollinating and just having those genes sort of swamped by um, a lot of the plants that are brought in from outside this region. So, so I think, you know, that is, um, you know, sort of a concern that I think is important. So, you know, is a native R better than a peony? Absolutely. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's about slowly making progress in the right direction. And if you've got a, a, a cultivar of a native, then it's, you know, probably. And I would, and I would say from the homeowner standpoint too, that I, I agree with everything that Jordy said, and I've been doing that process at my, on my own property where gradually I'm, I'm replacing things that aren't performing well, or if I want to get rid of something that I know is not a, a great plant and I'll pull it out. I would just say the recommendation would be to do small groupings. I think um, to purchase just one plant isn't going to necessarily in, ensure the success of it. So I would try to go for small groupings where you put three to five of the same plant um, in a location so that again, you're, you're going to have more bloom and more ability to attract pollinators from that. But it's definitely yeah. possible on a smaller scale. Yeah, definitely. And those, those plants in that small grouping, the color is an indicator to the bees or to the pollinators or to the beneficial insects that there's something there so that they travel to it, as well as birds for the seed. So it's important to have at least a few plants so that the color or the type of plant is enough for, to, to bring in those, those beneficials. Um, the other distinction that I've often made is that for a residential or a non-founder plot um, grower, the crossing of those genetics is not actually as uh, dangerous is too strong a word, but not as, um, doesn't have any re the same implications as it would if you were a founder plot. So the founder plots are being, it's an important distinction to make that the founder plots are being used to amplify a very specific set of genetics, whereas the um, homeowner may decide to mix, you know, native ours and, and native plants with um, less, less serious implications for larger restoration scale work. Um, so that might be sort of another, another distinction to make. Um, all right, so more questions, because I'm conscious of the time here. Um, let's see, uh, how do we propagate these for our founder plots? We talked about the protocol sheets. Um, what about the drought this year? Um, how have you seen, when we talk about these plants as being more persistent or being more resilient, um, for a farmer, um, we have been terribly drought stressed in Connecticut this year. Have you seen um, the same kind of stress and how have the natives respond to it versus um, some of the other plants in, in the habitats or in the farms? There's, there's no question that there's been stressors on them. And um, unfortunately, we've actually had to resort to watering uh, more than we have in the past. Last year, when we put in our initial founder plots, if you remember, it was a very wet June. <laughs> so there was absolutely no issue with, um, with dryness last year. But this year, it's been a huge concern, and it, and it hit right when we were putting in new plants and new rows. So those are the ones that were particularly, uh, we had to keep a really close eye on, the ones that were going in this year. The, the plants that were started last year have been very resilient. And I would say the only thing that we noticed is on the um, fistulosa, it has been stressed somewhat. So it was developing powdery mildew uh, because of the stress. But most of the other plants, the, the mint, the ironweed, the joe pie have done really well. They've, they really have, they're so established now this year that we really haven't even been doing any watering on them at all. And they've been perfectly fine.
Um, what about the fact that our climate is changing? I guess this goes more to, to Jordi and Jesse. Um, what about the fact that our climate is changing? Should we be trying to bring in plants from regions warmer than here to help out the pollinators that are moving north? Yeah, I mean, my, my personal feeling is, um, you know, sort of large scale environmental engineering. I just question whether we're really well equipped to be able to do that well and have enough knowledge. Um, I mean, I, I, this may be wrong to say, but I look at the Army Corps of Engineers and some of the things that they've done in the past with the best of intentions that have just been environmental disasters. Um, so I, I personally am sort of hesitant about that. You know, that may change. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's kind of my thought. Mm -hmm. Um, how can new farmers uh, get involved with this? For any other farmers who are on this call or who are out there um, in the network of, of growers, um, how do we tap into new farmers? I can certainly answer that from NOFA's side. I don't know, Sephra, if you are still out there, if you want to talk to speak to that question. My Zoom link. Will you repeat the question? The Zoom link That's here in sure. Vermont got a little bit um, muted. How how can new farmers get involved um, if they are seeing this and want to start founder plots on their own place? Um, yeah, that's that's really great. I would say first be in touch with me, and I will put my email um, in the in the chat. Separate ctnofa.org. Um, hopefully, we'll have more seed amplification. We'll be able to pair that with these protocols to help you get established. Also, Daryl Newman is from Planters Choice is also on the Zoom call. And um, he's been instrumental along with a lot of the land trusts and even Welton High Schools and the Pollinator Pathways that are also on this call and making these plants available. So what I would say is the next time, stay in touch with the Ecotype Project. And the next time we have a plant sale, you can purchase those plugs, put them in and join the founder plot um, facet of this project. The more the, the, the great thing is the more diversity of species that we have um, spread out throughout our ecoregion and on different farms, and the more founder plots we have, uh, the more pollinators we're hosting and the more diversity that we're helping to thrive. So please get in touch with me and we, we'd love to help you get started. Um, can you uh, list some, I mean, one or two of the other places in the state where founder plots are started this year? Absolutely. So um, the Yellow Farmhouse uh, Education and uh, Center up in Stonington, they've just taken on a founder plot. That's a remarkable resource where they do a lot of um, educational outreach and also have a, a thriving organic farm. Um, we are also working with uh, Speckled Rooster, which is a great organic farm in Easton. And um, also a Walding field. We have a nice Yarrow Founders plot there and are continuing to meet a lot of great farmers who are putting these on farm and I'm swiping away bugs, but that's what we want is we want the pollinators to come back. <laughs> so um, yeah, we, we actually have uh, a lot of great people that are emerging. And the thing is, is um, well, as, you, as you saw with the video, the founder plots are really quite gorgeous. It's become kind of main attractions on, I mean, now with these COVID times it's a little bit different but really becomes a centerpiece of, of action on the farm. And people really enjoy seeing it, seeing all the diversity of pollinators that are buzzing around. So they're really beautiful and they're just so beneficial to have on your landscape. Um, for our last question, um, and this maybe goes to not just Jordy and Jean um, and Abby and Jesse who have presented, um, but also for other folks who may wanna chime in in the chat. Um, I know we have a lot of experts um, around uh or listening in rather um the project the ecotype project is still so young as i said we're in our infancy and we're really looking for advice and we're looking for partners to know how to move forward um for those of you on the call what is your vision for the future of this project for specifically for jordy um gene and sephra um we have started by looking to create or to amplify the ecological services on farms, um, mostly for um, food security and for on farm the the um, support of on farm pollinators. Um, 
but do you have other sort of dreams for where this project can go? And I would love to talk about that for a few minutes before we before we end tonight's tour. If I could jump in for a minute, uh, Dina, this is Daryl for Planner's Choice. Hello, lovely to see you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my vision for this year was deliberately avoiding selling the landscapers, five back for wholesale nursery, and that's our primary market. And my logic was I thought it was much better to get small amounts into the hands of a number of homeowners. So with the aid of two excellent plant sales, uh, we basically sold out and I had a really strong feeling that was gonna be the case anyway rather than one landscape or one large scale development project, taking all these plugs, getting the word out of the ecotype project was more important to me than locking in that one big sale. So uh, I know Mary Ellen's on the call, I don't know if Jim Hunter is, or if we have any idea about how many different people got their hands on the plugs, but that's been my vision to date of the finished product after uh, the, the massive of undertaking a seed collection and, and founders plots and, the, and the, the either seed or property deals come to us and us growing them to, to a finished landscape size. Yeah, I think I, I, I mentioned a little bit, I, I think, you know, there are two scales, really scaling it to the homeowner scale that um, Daryl was just talking about, which I, I see so many lawns, I would love to see them all filled with uh, pollinator plants and, you know, instead of uh, lawn mowers and weed whackers out there every, every week. Um, it, you know, farmers, you think about the history of large scale farms removing milkweed. And now here's an opportunity for farmers to go back in and, and really, you know, make all the hedgerows and all the, the sort of side places of their farms into really viable um, habitat. But then also a lot of these, you know, the highways and a lot of these um, utility areas um, are such, there's such large potential there to really make them large corridors um, for, you know, migrating insects and, and just big habitat areas. So I, I just see a lot of places that this can go. Yeah, I would say that as far as uh, from the farm founder plot vision, I think what's really lovely is, you know, farms are, are definitely hubs for their communities. Um, many have CSAs that are already bringing folks onto the farm, that type of thing. I see it's a great educational opportunity for the farm to offer information to folks who are visiting the farm for other reasons. But I also see an extension of the Founder Plot program where you can actually start collecting seed, germinating, doing finished plugs on site, and making them available to your, to your community as well. So I think that the farms themselves can also become a distribution site um, for getting more of these plants out into their local communities. Um, Daryl did mention the plant sales that happened this spring uh, with the first ecotype plug production. Um, one was through Wilton High School, um, and so to speak to Jean's point about how sort of small scale um, partners can end up having big scale implications. Um, Wilton High School sold over 5,000 plugs in their plant sale. We were then joined by Aspatuck Land Trust, um, and they, I think, did a similar number at their plant sale. Um, Aspatuck is looking to have, so for some of the um, last bucket of questions I have are for uh, residential and, and uh, gardeners um, on the call, um, how can we get these plants? Um, Aspatuck, I know, is looking to have a plant sale in the fall again. Um, Daryl, you may want to speak to that as well. Um, we are certainly looking for other partners around the state, and I think um, someone mentioned in the chat here that um, the schools can be really great partners in all of this, and I know Wilton High School has been sort of a flag partner, um, but there may be other organizations out there as well um, that want to join us. Um, as I said, this is a pretty big table now with a lot of really incredible folks, um, but there may be folks out there who want to join us to do more plant sales across the state um, this fall. A lot of these plants actually establish quite well in the fall, um, and over the course of the next couple of months, um, we will be looking at their establishment um, with a few other virtual farm tours. Um, perhaps we'll even get up to Planter's Choice. Daryl, um, when you think about the fall planting of these things, do you want to speak a little bit about 
um, those plant sales and, and how effective or um, what the challenges are to planting these in the fall? Sure. Uh, so the biggest benefit to fall is uh, there's very low, it's a very low stress environment and, and roots on any plant continue to grow well past frost. Uh, well, provided it's, it's frost hardy, of course, if you're dealing in, a, in an annual you know, uh, uh, crops, that's a different conversation. So soil temperatures have to drop substantially. So we have, you have to get actual temps typically into the mid 20s before most every night before soil locks up enough that roots don't grow. So that's number one. Uh, the one big caveat, there's warm season grasses uh, that are critical for, not so much for, for, for feeding pollinators, providing food, but for habitat for them. And those only, only the cool season grasses are good. So a lot of the very large growing ones you've got to watch out for. But otherwise, there's a great number of these plants that do quite well in early fall uh, and, and a good sized plug. So the, so the 72s that are being cell plugs, uh, for those who don't know what, a set, what 72 means, that means that you have a 10 inch by 20 inch tray and that means there's 72 plugs in that. So as the number gets lower, the plugs get larger. So taking a 72 in, into an 18 cell tray, an 18 is somewhere around three and a half inch round or square, depending on what, what make you buy, versus somewhere around maybe not even an inch and a half with a 72, probably more like an inch and a quarter. But anyway, uh, so the, the things for, the plants for the cell are in 32s, which is a true two inch, maybe slightly larger than a two inch plug uh, that, that, that will take during that time of year, but you definitely want to use a larger plug. And the danger is they'll pop out of the ground with a freeze and thaw if they're not rooted by them. So definitely earlier in the fall is better. And again, some people say you're fine in early September to plant these uh, warm season grasses, but we're not going to offer them for the plant sale because I think it's critically important that people tell success stories about ecotype project plants. So I would definitely prefer for them to wait till next spring. Uh, if, if, if somebody who's seasoned and and, and we and we're absolutely confident could handle it. You know, a land a, a landscape professional, someone who's who's been in farming for a, for a while and understands soils and, and plants and roots. It would be a different conversation. But there will be uh, eleven species, uh, new species, I should say. Ideally, I, I can put stake my name to eight new species for fall for the fall plant sale. Uh, three I'm optimistic on, and if I get really really lucky, it'd be somewhere around fifteen. But let's. Let's say that a realistic range is, is, is going to be somewhere around nine, 10 plants, depending on how quickly we can finish them off and get good rooted saleable plants uh, for that fall sale. And uh, we're getting into enough for moist conditions with, with close to season, season round bloom, which of course is important for pollinators, as well as enough for shade. So initially, like Jordy said, uh, all the plants came from Highstead for the first sale and uh, other than the, other than a wood aster, uh, so they were from uh, kind of sunny meadow areas. Now we're getting into some moist plants that'll take the moist conditions as well as plants that'll take some shade, and and again offer that offer the year-round pollinator food. Other than of course what Jordy mentioned, early spring is hard, so there'll be there'll be some plants, but uh, not really shade for really early spring. We're still working on that one. The, the plant sale partners in the fall lined up are Wilton High School again in Aspatuck, um, which will be holding their plant sale at Gilberti's Nursery. So um, anybody can stay connected to the Ecotype Project and learn about those sales um, as they get their dates established in the upcoming weeks. Um, just in closing, um, before I turn this back over uh, to Sephra, one of the things that um, as we are talking about the vision for where this project may go, one of the things that it occurs to me, and particularly in watching how these plants take to the environment here and how strong they are, um, it really redefines that word resilience that we often use um, in the abstract. Um, and the drought for me this year has really redefined um, how that word feels and looks to me on my farm. Um, these plants are incredibly strong. Um, and it, one of the sort of dreams I guess I would have for the project is as particularly in Connecticut as we think about creating a resilient landscape for the future, um, getting more involved with coastal ecotypes um, and coastal plants seems critical to me as well. Um, that that may be some of our most hardest hit and fragile ecosystems in the state. Um, so I would, would share that with the group that um, I sort of uh, dream of that happening and then Lastly, 
I am also aware of how fragile sometimes young organizations or new projects can be. Um, and so part of the resilience of this entire project hinges on getting as many people um, excited and buying in to this vision as possible. Um, and so for Connecticut NOFA, um, we you know, are hosting free webinars like this. We are hosting free farmer trainings, um, but we desperately need support um, both in terms of the boots on the ground and in terms of donors who can step up um, to support this project um, and make sure that the work continues for years to come. Um, it's been so successful so far and I'm, and I'm grateful for everybody who has contributed. Um, but for those of you who are on the call, um, if you do want to participate or give to the project, you can do that through the Connecticut NOFA website. Um, and certainly stay involved with us through emails and listservs. And um, because you have registered, um, you won't be able to shake us now. So <laughs> you'll hear from us plenty in the next, uh, next few months as the project unfolds. Um, again, thank you all for those um, who are on the call and for those who may listen to this in the future as it will be recorded and put on our website. Uh, and over to you, Sephra, for any final thoughts. Um, thanks, Dina. I just I really want to thank you all for joining in on this conversation. When Dina talks about resilience, we can look at the resilience of any ecosystem is in its diversity. And the great thing that I just love about this project is you, you see the diversity of expertise that it takes to bring to the table to make this project possible. From Jordi and Jesse collecting the seed and growing it out to Abby and Jean really making sure that it does well in the founder pots and Monique making these these visuals um, and these videos available so that you all can see it. It, it really, it, it takes a village. And um, I see so many friends on the call. Again, Daryl making the, the plugs available to everyone and Mary Ellen LeMay from Askatuck Land Trust and um, Louise Washer from the Pollinator Pathway and Kim Stoner from the Native Plant Working Group and uh, Hope Leeson. And you know, what, what, what I'm trying to say is um, everyone here is a stakeholder in this. And what the Ecotype Project is really trying to do is kind of do a paradigm shift, not only of what our lawns and our backyards look like, but kind of how we're participating in this ecological resilience that we know we need. We don't have pollinators, we don't have produce on our farms. We all have vested interests, and even if it's the mailbox garden or a founder plot on a farm, our, our, our entomological friends, our pollinator friends are looking to us and when they find these habitats, you know, that, that provides the resilience and the health of our ecosystems and the restoration and the conservation that I think everyone here has a vested interest in. So we really hope that you stay in touch with us. As you've seen that infographic that I showed you, our intention with these virtual farm tours is really to walk you through each facet of that so you can meet the faces and the places that really make this project possible. So we will make sure to inform you all of when our next one will be. It'll be around seed collection time, which is a great party. And um, we'll also let you know when our next plant sales are. You can have ecotypes in your own landscape. So thank you all again and stay in touch. <laughs>